So this morning, we're back taking a look at the Ten Commandments. This morning, we're looking at the Sixth Commandment. It's in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. As we look here at the word of the Lord, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. And we begin today with the sixth commandment rather than the fifth, as I'm saving it as our text for Mother's Day, May the 14th. So the commandment to honor your father and your mother actually ties the two sections of the commandments together and I'll explain that more on Mother's Day, but maybe you're wondering, what are the two sections of the commandments? Well, generally, the first section, commandments one through four, deals with our relationship to God. And then the second section, commandments five through 10, deals with our relationship to people. So you've got the vertical with God and the horizontal with one another. Um, Jesus even alludes to these two sections and he ties them together as the first section as the great uh, commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Those the first four commandments, sum, that sums up the first four commandments. And then the second greatest commandment, Jesus said, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And that relates to the Commandments 5 through 10, the second set of the commandments. And so today, we're skipping number 5, though, and looking at number 6, which in Exodus 20, verse 13 says, You shall not murder. The King James Version says, Thou shalt not kill. However, not all killing is murder. So really, the best word choice here is murder. Now, God is telling us very clearly here that murder is forbidden. So why does God, why does he say it's forbidden? Why are we not to murder? Well, the first is probably simple. It's probably something you said as a parent. It's because I said so. <laughs> because he's God and he can do it. He can make the rules and he... This is his world, and he sets everything up, and he determines right and wrong. So that's number one, because he said so. Number two is because it is a sin to murder. Number three is because people are made in the image of God. That's a big reason why it's wrong. And then number four, because God is the giver of life and is the only one who has the right to take it away. So that's a fourth reason. So as we look at this commandment together today, and you listen, hopefully, to what I have to say this morning, uh, you might at some point feel helpless and hopeless as you realize you have broken this commandment. We all have, I'm telling you right now. Okay, I'm gonna explain that in a minute. But there's good news for you, so I don't want you to lose hope and think that, oh man, I'm doomed. No, there's hope, there's forgiveness in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you'll just kind of track with me through this as we walk through this verse, um, some of it might be uncomfortable, and it should be, um, but we should never become comfortable with sin. Uh, let, let's hear the bad news and let's allow sin to become exceedingly sinful. And then we will hear the good news as we shine the light of the gospel on this darkness in order to dispel. So this commandment, you shall not murder, teaches reverence for God's reign over human life. God reigns over human life. In fact, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 6, and again, I, I don't have any notes up here on the screen today. If you just want to jot stuff down, you go ahead as you feel led, or later, if you ever look at anything on YouTube, hopefully the sermon will turn out right on the video, and you can look at it again later. 
But 1 Samuel 2, 6 says that the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord does that. So what is murder? Well, here's a definition for you. Murder is the deliberate, willful, wanton, malicious, malevolent taking of human life by another human being. That's murder. Now, how is murder performed? The first way and the way we most think and think often of is with the hands. Somebody can use their hands and just choke you to death. Or they can use a hand that's holding a gun or a knife or whatever. There's lots of things, lots of ways that someone can commit murder with the hands. So that's one way with the hands. Number two is with the mind. And this is the one where all of us are guilty. Have you ever wished somebody didn't live? Like, have you ever like, I wish that guy was dead or hated somebody to that degree that, man. Or maybe, I'll, one of my pet peeves is bad drivers. And sometimes I wish I just had a little button to just, just blow out of the way, you know. That's wrong. Um, so there's, you can murder with your hands, but you can also murder with your mind. Maybe you'd call that mental murder. Uh, a lot of sins can, there's, you can, you can commit sins often in three ways, in thought, word, and deed. And so keep that in mind as we work through these. This is, this is the thought part. Uh, in fact, 1 John 3.15 says, Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So just take that into consideration. Don't try to make the Bible say something it doesn't because that's what it says. So you can murder with the hands, you can murder with the mind, you can murder with the tongue. In fact, James tells us about this when we were studying James back last fall. James 3, 8 and 9 says this, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an, it is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless, our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the image of God. So we can murder with the tongue. Thought, word, deed, all three right there so far, the very first three things I mentioned. But here's another kind of nuanced way that we can murder, if you will. We can murder with the pen or the keyboard or the text, you know, Thing. David, King David, killed Uriah by writing to his general Joab. And 2 Samuel eleven fifteen says, And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So, David used the pen to execute an order that would have Uriah killed. And he was. And then a fifth way that you can be uh, guilty is by plotting the death of another person. This goes along with murder in the mind. Um, but it's, it's planning. It's being in on you know, being an accomplice to murder. Even if you don't actually carry out the act of murder, you're guilty of planning it. That's sort of like when Jesus said, uh, as far as adultery is concerned, he said, 
Um, uh, if you look upon a woman to lust after her in your heart, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. So there's a, a head level and there's an actual physical level and there's a heart level. Or another way is by consenting to another's death, by just letting it happen. The apostle Paul consented to Stephen's death and he later said, this wasn't, well that was before he was saved. Uh, at that point he was known as Saul of Tarsus. He consented to Stephen's death and after he was saved later, he said in Acts 22, four, I persecuted this way, this faith, to the death. And he did. He used to put people in jail and have them killed because they claimed to follow Christ. So Paul was a murderer, but wow, wait a minute. Half of the New Testament was written by that guy and God used him in mighty ways. So don't lose hope. Okay. Uh, here's another one. By not hindering the death of another when it is within your power to do so. God values life more often than we do, and so we should all do all we can to stop the death of others when we can. I think that makes sense. And then a final way that we can, that murder can occur is by not executing the law upon capital offenders. God's word is very clear. In Genesis 9, 6, God said that whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And then in Romans 13, verses 2 through 4, the Bible says, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to those who do good, but to those who do evil. Right? Why do people run from the cops? Most of the time, it's because they did something wrong. Not always, but most of the time it is. That's just an example. Do you want to be unafraid of the authorities? Do what is good and you will have praise from them. For they are God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid for they don't bear the sword in vain. So they have, they have a sword that they can use to execute offenders that meet a certain standard. For they are God's ministers, an avenger to execute wrath on those who practice evil. So, uh, the authorities can become guilty of encouraging murder by not prosecuting. And that's happening today. So, murder may include, but not be limited to things like homicide. There's a lot of different types of death and killings that fall under the umbrella of homicide of which murder is one. And again, the deliberate, willful, wanton, malicious, malevolent taking of human life by another human being. And you know, if y'all watch the news enough or hear it or read it, it seems like not a day goes by without hearing about a shooting somewhere or a stabbing, or a mugging, or a beating, some act of violence somewhere in our country, and it's terrible. It's, you know, I'm not trying to be political here, and if you disagree maybe with what I'm about to say, you might think I'm being political, but I'm just calling it how I see it, I guess. Guns are not going off by themselves and killing people. Knives aren't coming out of people, people's pockets by themselves and killing people. Cars aren't deciding to start up on their own and run through crowds of people and kill them. It's the people wielding them as weapons 
who are committing the crimes. We hold people responsible, not weapons. It's like when, whenever somebody's pit bull attacks someone in the neighborhood, they hold the, the dog owner responsible, not the pit bull, because he's just being a dog. Um, we hold people responsible. You know, all those things have multiple good uses. Guns can be used for good. Knives can be used for good. Cars and trucks, whatever, can be used for good, whatever. But when you put them in the hands of people with no regard for God or the sanctity of human life, you get human depravity on display. And that's what we have going on full bore in our country. You know, when kids grow up being taught that they have evolved from apes, don't be surprised when they act like it. When a biblical understanding of God is not taught and kids are left on their own to find their way in life, you get a culture like we have today. When people are taught that religion is outmoded and is simply a way to control people, that it's a way to perpetuate a patriarchal system or to perpetuate racism or that is anti-woman or anti-homosexual or anti-whatever, uh, the people who believe this is true are going to fight against it. But it isn't true. We are pro-humanity. We love people. Doesn't matter who you are, what you are, where you come from. We're told to love people. The Bible says even love our enemies. So we are pro-humanity because we are pro-God. We want the best for people, for our community and for our country. We want people to thrive and excel and flourish. And the only way for this to happen is for people to believe in the God of the Bible, to trust in Him, and to obey Him. That's where it starts. That's the foundation. His purposes and his ways are for our good and his glory. When he says you shall not murder, it's for the good of everybody. And it's for the glory of God. They will benefit us as we follow his commands. The reason our country is in the mess it's in is because so many have propagated the lie that God isn't real or if he is, we would be confined to a life of drudgery and unhappiness if we lived according to his word. That's one of Satan's biggest lies, is that happiness comes in having and doing what God forbids. Those of us who know God and who know God's word know that is a lie. Happiness comes from knowing and doing what God says. Look. Again, look at our country. Running from God, denying God, and redefining God is not working. I mean, it's working if you want to destroy the country. It works for that, but it's not working if you want to make a great nation. People hate each other. They're killing each other. They have no regard for life or for property or for truth. And it's amazing how extreme everything is today. I mean, 10 years ago, I thought things were bad then. <laughs> but I never thought we'd be where we are today and see things like we do today. All the time, coming out, it seems like 24 seven. The assault on reality and truth is not making America a better place. That is not the way to the utopian society that so many claim they want. The only way to have utopia, which I would redefine as heaven on earth, is to turn back to God and his ways through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you get that. And I believe that the only reason America continues to exist right now is because of the Christians in this nation who are striving to be faithful to him. I think our nation would crumble into anarchy if not for sensible, God-fearing people 
who know what would happen if God completely took his hands off of our country. And aside from God's people trying to conserve what is good, God could not bless America and keep his reputation. So perhaps God, and, and we're always wondering, God, what are you up to? Why are you letting this happen? Perhaps God will use this chaos that's going on in our country to cause many people to wake up and see that all of this has come upon us because we have disregarded God and turned to our own way to do what is right in our own eyes. And when that happens, when God begins to awaken people, perhaps many will call out to the Lord and a spiritual awakening will come across our nation like we've never seen. I can only hope and we can only pray. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to move on. This is definitely going to be a two-part sermon, by the way. Um, so there's homicide. We see that going on all the time. And there's suicide. Man, people are killing themselves more like crazy, like you never before. What is suicide? It's self-murder is what it is. I'll tell you what it's not, though. It is not the unpardonable sin. Some people think that if you commit suicide, it's automatically go to hell, go straight to hell, don't pass go, you know. But it's not, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But related to suicide is the concept of euthanasia. That's sometimes called physician-assisted suicide. Christians must, from the start, oppose wrong thinking, which says that human beings have the right to decide the destiny of other human beings. We don't. That's God's prerogative. That's his right. God's exclusive authority, that, that's his exclusive authority, and we have no business taking that, even to take our own life. God alone reigns over human life. And if for some reason a Christian commits suicide, he's still saved. A truly saved person cannot lose their salvation. Now certainly there might be questions about the spiritual condition of the one who takes his own life. I get that. But I would encourage you to lean hard on Jesus who keeps all who are his and loses none of them. No one can snatch them out of the Father's hand, according to Jesus. So there's homicide, there's suicide, there's genocide. You ever heard of that, genocide? It's the murder of a large group of a certain ethnicity where very often racial superiority is the motivator. Genocide is sometimes referred to as ethnic cleansing, like Hitler did with the Jews. You know, that would be one example of that. Um, when genocide occurs, sometimes, like as with Hitler, a war often results as a response to that, to counter that, to prosecute the offenders and protect the vulnerable. And the killing that takes place within the context of a just war, and we'll talk about that next time, is not murder. Um, there are times when killing is justified, and it's not murder. Then there's, here's another form of murder that it's kind of new to me. I never knew the title for it. Sinicide, S-E-N-I. C-I-D-E, sin is side, which is the intentional murder of senior adults because they've outlived their perceived usefulness to society and are considered a drain on resources. So to do what is best in the interest of the state, death is to be administered or needed care may be withheld. That's even being discussed today. Then there's the opposite of sinicide is infanticide. It's 
the murder of a child within its first year of birth, in most cases by its mother. I mean, how terrible. How evil. If there's such a thing as innocence, certainly it would be among infants. And they don't deserve this, but the one who murders an infant deserves to die. But then we all deserve to die. And somebody's done something so that we don't have to. So just think about that. All right, then here's the one that has really been talked about in our country a lot, and that's abortion. Again, what is it? It's the deliberate, willful, wanton, malicious, malevolent taking of a pre-born human's, pre human's life by another human being, whether it is the mother or a medical professional, whether by surgical procedure or pill. This is murder in the womb. And science is very clear that the emerging life in the womb begins at the union of the sperm and the ovum, which constitutes human life. Life begins at conception. The embryo, fetus, baby, child, teenager, adult, are all simply different stages of human life. Where you are doesn't define your humanity. And nor does when you are define your humanity. That one is either inside the womb or outside is what defines humanity. God defines life. God created the process of life development from the womb to the tomb. And in Exodus 21, verse 28, the Bible even talks about if a beast kills a man, it was to be stoned and its flesh was not to be eaten. Now, if God would have a beast that killed a man stoned, though it had not the use of reason, because it's a beast, to restrain it. Think how much more he's incensed with those who, against reason and conscience, murder preborn babies. There should be great lamentation over this. So plan your parenthood before you become one. Don't get the cart before the horse. Follow God's plan for marriage and family. Keep sexual relations within the bonds of the covenant of marriage. And one of the major reasons that this world is messed up has a lot to do with the misuse, abuse, and misunderstanding of what God's plan is for sexuality and marriage. And then don't forget, adoption is a wonderful option that is pictured in scripture. Those of us who are saved, we've been adopted into God's family um, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I could do a, an entire sermon on the issue of abortion. I don't feel like I need to. Um, but for now, I want you to just keep listening and try to keep tracking with me because if you're feeling guilty about any of this, I still want you to know there's good news to come. So don't give up, don't lose hope, hang on. I'm not here to make you feel guilty but that you will understand you actually are guilty and your only hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. So homicide, suicide, genocide, sinicide, abortion, how about poison? Every day we hear about the drug epidemic in our country. There are legitimate drugs, thank God, and drug makers whose drugs can be used for good. But sometimes people take them and use them illegitimately in a harmful way. That's not the fault of the drug maker or the doctor if they're legitimately uh, prescribed and dispensed. If these legitimate drugs are used illegitimately by the consumer, it's the fault of the drug taker, not the drug maker. But there are illegal and very dangerous drugs that are smuggled into our country across an open and unsecured border that originate from China and other countries 
that want to kill Americans. They want to weaken our country and ultimately destroy our nation. These drugs are laced with poison and are in and of themselves poison. They kill thousands of people every year. And these, uh, those involved in drug trafficking in any form at all are guilty of murder. They are accomplices and they are complicit. But listen, along the same lines, we could make the case that someone who knowingly sells bad meat or food products that results in someone's death is complicit in murder. And again, I'm just gonna throw some things out for you to consider. What about bartenders who just keep the drinks coming after knowing a patron is already drunk? And then the person goes out and dies. How about uh, an employer who jeopardizes the lives of employees and others through unsafe surroundings and working conditions? They should be held responsible. Well, a couple more, and then we'll be done. Attrition. Attrition. You say, what? What do you mean? I think with attrition, I mean psychological murder. A very slow death over time. Someone might say the words, you're killing me. You know, if you keep doing this, it's going to kill me. It's going to be the life of me. Just an example. For example, a young man comes home night after night drunk, and when his mother complains and tries to reason with him, he curses her out, rails at her, and just kills her little by little, wearing her down mentally over time, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. He's slowly driving a dagger into her heart, and she dies. Tell me that's not murder. And then there's inaction. This is the last one I wanna share with you this morning. Inaction, by not doing what you should be doing to deter and dissuade murderers. In fact, Romans 13, four, we read it earlier. Um, it's funny how when you have a large print Bible, there's more pages to turn. All right, Romans 13, four, for he, is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. You know, where there is no fear of punishment, crime is encouraged. We are seeing this now all across our country where progressive district attorneys are letting criminals go. They're not locking them up. They're not putting them in jail. They're not going to trial. And the charges are being dropped because the criminals are really the victims. They're the victims of the system. And that's why they are looting and stealing and murdering. This is justice for them over the system that has not worked for them. And that's how these progressive district attorneys view this. But by not punishing evildoers, public security and peace will not be preserved. This is what's happening now. It should not matter who you are. If you break the law, you need to be held responsible. Equal justice under the law is what there should be. I know it's not always, but that's what we should go for. That's what we should aim for. In fact, it violates the law of love not to punish lawbreakers because it does great harm, it does great injury to the common good of our country and our community if we let that go unchecked. And so, let me close with this. If you have broken this commandment about murder, whether it's in thought, word, or deed, there's hope for you. And that hope is not based on anything that you have done or might do, it's solely based upon what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for sinners. We broke God's law and Jesus paid our fine. God can forgive us on the basis of what Jesus did for us on the cross and by rising from the dead. That payment for your fine only gets applied though to your life when you trust the Lord Jesus with all your heart. 
Look unto him, the Bible says, and be saved. If you're guilty of murder, whatever form it takes, whether it be by the hands, with the mind, with the tongue, with the pen, by plotting, consenting, any of those things, every murderer who repents and trusts in the Lord Jesus will be forgiven. That is true. That is what the Bible says. There will likely be temporal punishment on this side of heaven because you've broken laws. But eternal punishment will be done away with and will be replaced by eternal life for all who trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That is great news. King David took the life of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. God's grace forgave him. Moses killed an Egyptian. God forgave him and used him mightily. Saul of Tarsus held the clothing of men who stoned Stephen to death. He and Stephen was the first Christian martyr. And he had Christians persecuted to their death. And yet the blood of Jesus was sufficient enough to forgive and save Paul. It's sufficient for you too. His blood, as we sing in that old hymn, his blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avails for me. So trust in the Lord Jesus Christ today and let him take the guilt of this from you. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, he, your word says that no murderer has eternal life, no thief, no idolater, no adulterer, and your word goes on. But then it says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were transformed, you were saved. Lord, I pray that today, if there's anyone here who has felt hopeless and destitute, if you will, without hope, in this life that they would come and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who will completely revolutionize and change their life. May they trust in him. May they trust in you today. And Lord, help us to go out from this place when we leave soon and be salt and light and be people on mission for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.